Okay. Hi, everyone. Hey, Mark. How are you? Are you all right, Andrew? I'm good. Hey, Dwayne. Hey, what's up? Good to see everybody. And Mikey's here. Hey, Mikey. Hi, hey, how guys. are you? Are you all right? Doing? doing good. How are you? Good, good. Juan Young's here, too. <laughs> awesome. Hey. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we've... Uh, um, we've we've put these uh these these seminars together i mean I'll, I'll speak for a little bit in the introduction and Dwayne can say something and then we'll kick off but uh the idea of, of these seminars um came together after you know several conversations and publications that um that Dwayne and i've been engaged in and a signifier kept on repeating again and again and again this idea of saturation um and the you know question of opposition um in regards to questions of constitutive negativity and how that works as a heuristic device or an interpretive device in our current hell paradigm which we're in at the moment and and yeah so a lot of the stuff that we've been put you know some of the we've been putting out Dwayne's work it's been sort of spread over and so the idea is uh, to, to, to get to try and formulate what these ideas are to try and get a conversation around them and to critique them um does that make sense so i'll i'm going to uh, pass Dwayne to say a little bit more and then i'll uh, i'll go first um and then um Dwayne will go and then people will ultimately um you know jump in and, and we can talk about that this stuff is that all right good sounds great Sounds great, Mark. I, I really don't have too much to say right now. I, I, I'll see what you uh, have to say when you speak, but uh, thanks for coming, um, you three. Uh, it's uh, going live on Facebook right now. Um, I didn't advertise it, so I really don't expect too many people to to really show up. I barely advertise the thing, but it will go onto um, YouTube after we're done. Um, so we have a rough idea, an orientation. We have this word saturation. Let's see what can be said. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. All right. Um, the way I, I usually, as I work from a script, and then when a tangent comes up, I'll, I'll go off in that direction. And then I'll, I'll gradually come back to the text. Or sometimes I just throw the notes away and go where I want. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping I'll, I'll stay quite close to the text where I put it here. So... To initiate our conversation, I'd like to outline <clears throat> several foundational discussion points that I've tried to distill into nine primary elements. Over time, Dwayne and I have been crafting this idea that has emerged across various publications and dialogues. In essence, our position revolves, and you know, Dwayne can challenge me on that as well, around questioning the use of negativity as an analytic tool for understanding where we are particularly now in our current predicament. So the following nine points encapsulate themes uh, that, that have frequently come around or, or we've circled around almost like a drive in our, in our writings. But again, this is my interpretation of where I've come up wrote these down today and you know Dwayne you can challenge these at any given point or you can elucidate them and some of them might be absolutely crap and you know you can uh, challenge them yourselves or, or put a but again the idea is to, is to put a conversation out there so the first point one the digital is saturation the digital is saturation the concept of the saturated is largely associated with philosophers like Jean-Luc Marion, who sees in relation to phenomenological givenness, this concept of givenness, which obviously he takes from Jacques Derrida. But the way I'm talking about it, or the way we're conceiving it, the concept of saturation, and I, I can't uh, talk for Duane here, is that it works in conjunction with a, with a larger transition in our paradigm that moves it outside of, the, of a previous interpretive paradigm of doubt and lack. Saturation is the name 
of the world of absolute communicative proximity, proximity and flux that the digital now gives us. And with that comes, with, within this communicative paradigm, comes this sense of certainty. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'll come to my second point. Number two, the saturate, saturation apes the theological. Saturation apes the theological. In the medieval e era, the world was seen through a lens of divine abundance uh, and, and grace. And with modernity, as we know, this medieval view was eventually replaced with doubt and lack. And, you know, we had Descartes sitting in his room with his, you know, thing, uh, with his Cartesian doubt. And eventually, um, you know, as we move through the entirety history of philosophy, existential insecurity is in intensified by recent capital and global crises. Our shift from an era of scar scarcity now to one of digital saturation has unmoored our sense of self along with various linguistic and societal structures. What we call desire is overshadowed by an insatiable pursuit for digital stimulation, or what we could come to term jouissance. As language and communication fray in this deluge, not deluge, um, I, understanding, each, uh, understanding each other becomes a challenge, not, not because meaning is absent, but because meaning ultimately overwhelms. So this, this modern condition, which is highlighted by Byung-Chul Han, marks us as subjects in perpetual chase, leading to burnout. And in response, many turn to reductive psychotherapies or conspiracy theories, preferring oversimplified answers. Um, and we see it everywhere. There was a really good article that came out today. I don't know if anyone managed to see it. It was in the Hedgehog Review by Anton Barbake, Enchantments of the One and the zero mirror is really good. It, was, it reflects a lot of the stuff that we're, we're talking about here. Three, we're all Schmittian now in the flood. We're all Schmittian. In the realm of the, of the digital deluge, uh, we, we've all become Schmittian. No, obviously Carl Schmitt, controversial theorist, posited the distinction between adversaries, a competitor within a shared system of rules and enemies whom one opposes absolutely and po possibly violently. So within this ceaseless barrage of online information, stimulation and communication, or non-communication, I should say, the, 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 the distinction has gone. Everyone's an enemy. There are no, no adversaries anymore, right? Now, I, you know, I've got no time for, you know, I know he comes with baggage in every, every which way but loose, but there's an absolutism to the positions that we're seeing now in, in terms of the digital de de deluge. Uh, it, every, there is this over proximity uh, and you can see this sort of hyper um, projection where we can only see others as an extension of ourselves or as an absolute enemy. We don't afford anything or anyone the dignity of, of, of an adversary or even an opponent anymore. So enemies are everywhere. In the flood, if we go back and this is you know, going to my sort of theological trade, you know, one of the most fascinating stories that uh, was in 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 Genesis is, is the stories of the Canaanites, you know, and I'm not not the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the the people who are going to get completely drowned, you know, after the flood. And I, I constantly think to myself, what would it be, you know, uh, to be like to be one of these people to know that you know that's it, you're doomed, you know. Um, you're going to be flooded out. There's nothing that you can do uh, that's going to change your fate. You are ultimately just waiting out uh, the coming apocalypse. Apocalypse has already happened, so to speak. So my argument here is that there's an echo of how we're almost like the, the Canaanites, reaching uh, towards man-made constructs for salvation or what we call the Latus, like like the, the mythological descendants of Tubal Cain, uh, who was apparently renowned for his crafting abilities. Uh, we turn to artif artifices for solace and protection. We seek refuge in 
various technological marvels from the, the various social daddies out there that you know that we've got you know um, and we even now i know there's an irony that we're using facebook uh to to, to what's uh, to, to push this out and i'm not but I, I don't plan on saying thank you um to zuckerberg for that but you know uh we can see it you know with elon but at the end we, we, we see this turn to the digital as almost this, this term for salvation and we seek refuge in these things however these tools which might seem divine or godlike in their capacities uh ultimately accelerate our demise instead of guiding us to i don't know safe, safe shores their prosthetic deities are tech and these these um tech infused con constructs they often immerse us even deeper in, into these waters Again, I, I honestly recommend look, reading this article. That, uh, what was it by by, um, by Anton Barbicay, Enchantments of the of, of the One and the Zero Mirror. That really brings out uh, it comes up with a great term for it. Techno techno knowledge, he calls it. This I uh, this term of where we're investing in these um, the these prosthetic gods, which I'm sure Dwayne will be able to elucidate in better terms than I can. Anyway. Uh, Number five, in the flood, positions, and I think this is uh, the point that I, I think will be more contentious. Number five, in the flood, positions of constitutive negativity always assume that we're on dry land. So in this relentless surge, our current digital this inundation, theories anchored in constitutive negativity presuppose a stability akin to standing on dry land. Once these positions effectively described various quandaries, uh, painting a decent picture of our dilemmas. However, in the contemporary scene, I think things have vastly altered. And you can we we we, we talked about this as you know the various um, instances we, we we call it the one all alone, right? Um, and the, the failing of the symbolic order, in some ways. But the original negations around these theories were predicated upon having themselves uh, being negated, making their foundation ultimately shaky. Sorry, that sound, isn't it? Uh, our starting point shouldn't be the void of negativity, but ultimately looking at the flood of positivity that's all around us, an all-encompassing digital flood that we need to take into account even before getting off the ground with this stuff. Six, a symptom of the flood is our inability to imagine a future. So in the overwhelming tide of the digital age, a glaring symptom is our collective loss of a, of a of future imagination. It is we're stranded amidst uh, torrential rains with no horizon in sight. The, the concept of, of, of even a small future seems elusive. The world feels a post-apocalyptic already consumed by cataclysm, rendering thoughts of tomorrow is ultimately moot. We're inundated with constant distractions, a barrage of truthiness, superficial I, truths in, which are devoid of any depth or fact. And, and yeah, Dwayne put that's a really good uh, term he used the other term, but he said, um, you know, we have these, where, where, what was it that you said? Politics, we're sold politics rather than politics safe, taming capitalism. It was a really good term. But, um, you know, I'm going off track. Um, but our critiques of systems like capital become outdated or even misplaced. We can't even grapple with the capitalism we once know or once knew. Uh, number seven, we start from the disintegration of the paternal metaphor. The anchoring fiction that allows us to orientate ourselves has gone. This does not mean anything like we're all psychotic. I think that that's a uh, uh, misnomer. We don't start from that position. It just means that the discourse that we are in is psychotic. The flood of meaning is psychotic, just as the lack of meaning in the previous paradigm is one that is neurotic. But to be in this psychotic paradigm means that the symptoms that show themselves in our day-to-day -day living do not fall under universal structural systems, right? This means that the DSM-5 and also Lacanian triadic diagnoses are equally problematic in diagnosing, in navigating the flood 
without merely becoming a part of it. Okay? Eight, the unconscious has always been a fiction. There has never been anything essential or fixed about Freud's concept of the unconscious. It is something that worked. It's something that once worked, and Lacan attempted to make it work again. It does not work now. The unconscious is a fiction in the flood because there is no language to sustain it. Language itself, what it is, how it functions, works on the premise that we allow ourselves to be duped. But today, the non-dupes err. And as such, there is no unconscious in the flood. This is why we have, in the language of the therapeutic, a whole buffet of, of, um, of various uh, systems or whatever, presenting different uh, and plenty of different people uh, presenting so many different symptoms, but no talk or place of the unconscious, right? There's no talk of, there's talk of the symptom everywhere or symptoms, but no talk of the unconscious. If I say I do not believe in the unconscious, if I say I do not believe in the unconscious, no one would blink, no one would care because it's not necessary for many people to understand the various traumas or symptoms that they have today. No one would bl blink an eyelid. Number nine, love is the only thing that can allow a stepping out. Lacan, even in his very late work, shows that psychoanalysis is a cure through love, through transference. Um, and you see this uh, in his seminar, The Unbewupst, um, seminar 24. Is. So, in essence, it is about creating uh, the conditions of an unconscious. So there are nine points, and you know the, the, the things that I've put down that we've been circling around, and it's stuff that uh, you know, it's based on ideas or conversations that we've been working through, uh, which stem from the general idea of what we call the clinic of the real. I've got a few other notes here that I, I wanted to talk about. I'll go through that sort of stemmed off from this. Um, and then after that, I'll hand it over to you. Dwayne, is that okay? I'm going to kick out a bit more. So, so I want to talk about, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychoanalyst. I'm not a psychoanalyst. I'm a, I'm a, a phil philosophical theologian. That's what I was trained in with a big focus on studying Lacan, who I, I, I love. Uh, and I just want to sort of, as I was going through these things, I wrote some notes down that I just want to share and put out there that probably might, you know, encapsulate or crystallize what I'm getting at. The medieval theological worldview was not predicated on scarcity or constitutive negativity as conceptualized by the, the early and middle Lacan. Instead, this medieval view was conceived as a reality imbued with supernatural abundance of God's grace. It was a universe where we participated in the reality of God, and it infused a world with a profound sense of the metaphysical. Most people know this when you look back at theology, you understand that this is the position where it comes from. The fullness of existence was always looked at in donative terms, and this can be seen right the way through in Augustine and Aquinas. Creation was seen in light of contingency of existence. God is necessary, but ultimately creation is gift. It's contingent. In the advent of modernity, however, marked by a seismic sh shift from the spiritual plentitude to an, extent, an existence punctuated by doubt and lack, what we call a paradigm of givenness took over over gift. What is given is a world marked by rupture, both metaphysical and epistemic. Uncertainties and existential insecurities began to dominate the human psyche, a reality that has only been exacerbated by the, the series of political and economic crises uh, that have rattled the globe, globe since the turn of the millennium. In parallel, the relentless march of consumerism and overproduction coupled with the sweeping changes brought about by digitalization has radically transformed the ways of relating to the world and each other. It's a transmutation that takes us from an era of scarcity to one characterized by digital saturation. So we can see a transition from gift to given to saturation, okay? This, 
as I say, is, is, I think is due to a degeneration of the paternal metaphor. And um, there's material conditions that uh, you know line up with that. So in our paradigm, the role of desire, which has been central to psychosocial structures, is progressively being usurped, usurped by a relentless drive for jouissance. This unbound pursuit in the face of a ceaseless barrage of digital stimuli reflects an unmooring of subjectivity. And as we navigate this, this digital saturation and the consequent displacement of desire by jouissance, socio-symbolic -symbol structures that once fostered a shared understanding and facilitated communication are increasingly breaking down. People are losing the capacity to com comprehend each other's positions, not merely due to ideological or sociological divides, but because language itself, the very medium of our shared understanding, is starting to fray. The only way to countenance the other is either to see them, as I've said, as an extension of ourselves or as absolute enemy. However, contrary to what some analytic philosophers might propose, this disintegration of language doesn't result in an absence of meaning. Instead, we find ourselves overwhelmed by a deluge of signification, an excess of meaning that verges on the toxic. And this hyperabundance of meaning can become oppressive, even destructive, as it drowns us in a surfeit of you know, myriad interpretations and possibilities. This contemporary situation has ultimate, I think, and Dwayne might disagree with, you, disagree with me, has been well described by Byung Chul Han, as I've said, in his critique of digital society. According to Han, the proliferation of digital communication technologies has turned us into achievement subjects, chasing away more uh, and more uh, as a, in an unending pursuit, which instead of generating uh, fulfillment, produces burnout and exhaustion. We're also seeing the rise of popular psychotherapeutic and conspiracy theories. The former offers simplistic solutions to psycho uh, psychological problems, whilst the latter gives far fa far fetched explanations for a world in disarray. But what is the answer to the flood? What is the answer to the flood? Marcus Pound is a Catholic Lacanian theologian, believes that the Eucharist offers a traumatic point by which we can mediate the overwhelming uh, place of the, of the positive. I, I disagree, not with the concept of the Eucharist, but with the interpretation he's given it. Going back to the ancient worldview for a minute, Marcus Pound believes the Eucharist as more than a mere ritual. He sees it as a conduit for the immense and overflowing grace of God, in a world that might be overwhelmed by the sheer abundance of God's mercy and love. The Eucharist, for pound, acts as a mediating instrument. It parcels out grace in digestible amounts, no pun intended, allowing believers to partake in the divine without being consumed by its magnitude or the trauma of grace. So through the Eucharist, the vastness of God's love in creation becomes accessible, tangible and assimilable to the faithful bridging the infinite and the finite in the in, in uh, the act of, the, of of a sacramental act of what we call participation my problem with this specific interpretation is that it suggests that we are really in a world of constitutive negativity and we have forgotten about such gracious gracious abundance hence pound is saying we are coming at the eucharist all wrong the suggested error is that people come to the Eucharist as a way to directly get access to God's grace in a negative reality. When in reality, what Marcus is saying is that we need to remember that creation is actu actually already ontologically positive, overbearingly positive. And what the Eucharist is actually offering is a point of negativity via which God's superabundance, which we have forgotten about, can be mediated. I think the problem of saturation leaves us with an issue far more encompassing. If Pound's reflection is predicated on us working from a place of negativity, how do we deal with a world that apes the donative, the giftedness and the fullness of the theological? The sacramental communicative aspect of, the Euchar of, of Eucharistic activity must contend with the positivity of the flood. The point, from my perspective, is that the Eucharist has to make space in our false plenum to mediate something more. Like the analytic position, it is about an impossibility, a space made from love, 
via which we can step out from. Maybe. The word liturgy literally means work of the people. And like Lacan, the analyst has to put the analyst on to work, to step out from the fullness of the symptom. And it's important to not, it's, it isn't, it's important not to move in either direction here. I don't want to give a psychoanalytic interpretation of the Eucharist, nor do I want to give a theological interpretation of the analytic discourse and, and various processes such as the past that come with that as being linked to the Eucharist. But there is something here worth reflecting on. And again, I reiterate the issue. We are not contending with a world that is predicated on scarcity. We are living in a world of absolute abundance and contraction. So we are situated where we have to fight fire with fire. Okay, abundance with abundance, or more accurately, to contend with the faux positive. The late Lacan was known from, for moving from a schema of negativity and desire to a system that worked off jouissance as such. We know there is a difficulty here. Why? Because instead of creating nice, simple, easy to use systems that makes the transmission to philosophical discourses, we have a clinic of the real that is much closer to, the, to a work that is reminiscent of the singular encounter in the clinic. Lacan said that analytic discourse cannot operate as a, as a social bond in terms of politics. But I still think there is work to be done. But we all, but we need to confront the positivity of the flood. I'm not going to say that we should remain positive. We've had far too much of that. The positive is everywhere. Uh, and that's our problem. Uh, and at that point, I'm going to hand you over to Dwayne. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic uh, paper. I wonder where you'll be publishing it. I don't. I, I put, it, put it together. It's just thoughts that um, we come in today, and I'm sure there's plenty of stuff that can be cleaned up or contended. And that's why I'm opening it up here for you guys to to advise me and point me in the right direction. What a need <laughs> to Let's orientate see. me. Sure. Let's see. I, I wanted to say, if it's okay, uh, it's so great to see each one of you. Not all of you, but each one of you. Each one of you uh, is unique to me. And I'm so happy that you're here. Um, thank you. I can't, I, I feel like I need to mention, It's. I mean it quite literally, it's flooding in Slovenia today. Yes. It's flooding in Slovenia. And we have the Slovenian schools inheritors here with us today. I think we can all say, almost all of us here, that we are inheritors of a certain Slovenian tendency. But it is flooding in Slovenia. Um, I, I don't quite know where to begin. I'm going to be slower today. Um, please go easy on me while I try and find an orientation. Um, I suppose I'll begin with this word, uh, saturation. Uh, I didn't say suturation, because I think that would uh, lead us toward the other side of Jouissance, of the relation of the subject to its signifying structure. That uh, later logic on suturation was famously explored by Jacques-Alain Miller during a presentation in Lacan Seminar in February of 1965. But I think if we are to stand upon the foundation that Lacan laid seven years earlier, 1958, I think, when he distinguished true from false psychoanalysis, then we're led to presume that suturation is a false equivocation with saturation, false from the standpoint of psychoanalytic discourse. Why? Psychoanalysis depends upon the experience that it entails. I think I'm quoting Lacan from 1958, True and False Psychoanalysis. I think he said it just like that. Um, it depends upon the experience that it entails. It concerns the speaking being's particular relationship to speech and truth. We could add Jewish Psalms. 
psychoanalysis is not a hot soup, despite what I've heard on Facebook recently from some who oppose uh, Lacan and Lacanian analysis. They call it a soup, the Lacanian soup. Psychoanalysis is not a hot soup, even if Miller presented himself as a sous chef uh, during that presentation on suture. Uh, my point is that we shouldn't allow ourselves to get too carried away by the coolness of language, even if it involves homophony. Uh, at best, wordplay is a kind of sauce. It's a jua sauce that you can spread liberally upon your discourse. But the word saturation. I think was invoked often enough over the last few years of, I can speak for myself, my seminars in the last eight years, I've heard myself say sat saturation so many times that it led me to highlight it uh, by isolating it, even by elevating it. Does it imply that it's a master signifier? Saturation. I, I don't think so. Um, it's strange when a word that designates, as Mark put it, a toxicity of jouissance stands in place of the master signifier, S1, uh, spreading itself over it. I think that's how you put it, Mark, spreading it, spreading over it. Um, in such cases, the master signifier swoons to jouissance, producing astu for you to enjoy. S2. It's a, it's a stew that keeps you fed, which means that you're fed by your enjoyment. I think it's even the basis for the American Happy Meal or the Western Buffet. You mentioned the buffet, Mark. Um, I think it's also frequently referred to as a cold table. And I'm told by my son that uh, children are quite fed up with uh, the Happy Meal today. Um, it's not quite the surplus enjoyment that I imagined it to be when I was a child. But the point that I wanted to make was that interpretation should not be expected to desaturate jouissance. Instead, des autres eight. That's uh, another false equivocation. <laughs> des autres eight. Um, to my French Canadian ears, uh, des autres eight uh, maybe has more meaning than it does to yours. Uh, Lacan's statement in La Troisième was that meaning, to be clear, it's a mode of interpretation, meaning can feed the symptom. And Freud, who moved from dream interpretation to uh, the analysis of symptoms, revealed that substitute satisfactions can pass in an there can be an alliance between the id and the ego without any need of what he called fresh repressive measures. And I think that raises problems for the practice and teaching of psychoanalysis. I think there's too many cooks in the psychoanalytic kitchen. One is already too many. As uh, Gilles Deleuze said, since each of us are many, there's quite the crowd. There are too many people cooking up interpretations today. So much so that one feels compelled to choose which interpretations to digest uh, from the psychoanalytic smorgasbord and which to leave behind. And then there's a proclivity toward junk food. These are the dietary habits of the bricoleur. Uh, as for the buffet, it's a bookshelf and a social media feed. Without limits, that's always the question we ask when we go to the buffet, what are the limits? And it's enough to make those of us who follow Lacan out to be picky eaters. But days autres eight, I think that's what psychotherapy often does. 
the therapist will eat you up with his or her interpretations, or he or she or they will be ate up by the interpretations of their patients. I guess um, I'm a little bit excited today because I just discovered that I do have some questions. <laughs> I have two questions, I think, um, both of which have to do with the symptom fed by a particular modality, a particular mode of interpretation. I said mode, which was also the word chosen by Karl Marx, not median, not medium mode. Uh, because it seems to me that psychoanalysis does not operate according to the aphorism, that the medium is the message. Our approach strives to establish a new relationship to one's environment, to the other, and also to Jouassons, a new pact with the other, a new pact with Jouassons. So to eat one's Dasein, I don't think will get us very far. There must also be recognition from the other, which is a, a point that Jacques Alain Miller made um, in a seminar uh, on the new. I think it already shows us how much further we can go from uh, the media ecologists who merely take the object as environment, medium. It's not our message. And it was a point that Malher made when he said that the Lacanian father is the one who says yes. Not no, but yes. To the particularity or singularity of one's enjoyment, desire. He says yes to desire. Or to put it another way, the Lacanian father against knowledge, against the ideals of knowledge. Uh, says yes to the particularity of desire. So I don't think it's enough to study the environment. There's also this transformative dimension to psychoanalytic experience. Um, social media, can it feed the symptom? It saturates us, or to put it in the words of the pioneer of media ecology, Marshall McLuhan, it works us over completely. That's saturation. I have no trouble suggesting that it's incestuous because it functions without limits. And uh, a few years ago, I was asked by some people on Facebook, I think, uh, to make Astu out of Marshall, McLuhan, and Jacques Lacan to make S2. And because I've never been a good cook and I'm a bit of an anorexic, I resisted it. But it seems to me that the equivocation, the medium is the massage, can't guarantee any effect without risking continuity with the environment, a cooling or a flipping of that environment. To study the environment at this level, does it remain too clever for its environment? Maybe it remains caught up with the medium, the cleverness of the medium, unable to recognize it as an object of intelligence. Uh, conversely, psychoanalytic discourse places as to upon the burning coils of truth, which makes it an apparently hot medium, except for the fact that it also probes analysts to speak, which makes it characteristically cool. So I think that's our mode of operation. Okay, so what's the question? My question, is interpretation an object of psychoanalysis? Um, we know that it gets put to work in the intellectualization of obsessional neurotics whose interpretations keep moving. Good work as good work for the master. But, uh, I don't know. Maybe would you believe me? I uh, recently I was to uh, I was approached by uh, uh, I was asked to discuss artificial intelligence with one of the world's leading global technology companies, 
And I, I'm convinced that they were very disappointed by what it was that I had to say because the, the conversation approached its limits very quickly, uh, which I think means I was able to shut them up. Uh, but for them, it was a matter of monetizing intelligence through its possible uh, therapeutic applications. Take note of the complicity of science, therapy, and capitalism. Even when we add the prefix anti, it's not clear how to distinguish them from one another for me. They're the same machine, the same symptom. And perhaps it's what Lacan meant when he said in his later teaching, there is only one social symptom. It leads me to my second question, which is maybe a bolder one. Is intelligence itself a symptom? You know, uh, what what stops us from pursuing this question other than maybe our own fear of being reduced to stupidity? I think it'd be an achievement, uh, especially for those whose intellect moves too fast for their own good. And I think we can find them all around us in our environment, on Twitter, in the universities, and even in the clinical consulting rooms. It's what Lacan named philosophy reminding us that we all do more of it than we are prepared to admit. But feeding the symptom with interpretation, that's how Lacan put it in La Troisième, you can feed the symptom with meaning. I don't think it's necessarily homologous with taking interpretation as a symptom. So I think that's what constitutes my step forward. I think it's not stupidity that troubles me, it's intelligence. What can we do with it? Maybe it's a matter of putting it in, its, in the right place. Lacan said, maybe you know, that there's nothing so special about the outcome of one's analysis. Madness or stupidity, take your pick. So we can't claim that the mad are without intelligence. The speaking being can bring a swoon to us too, which sounds a bit stupid maybe to you, but there's more meaning in it than you're prepared to admit. From what is problematically called common sense, it sounds like rubbish. But why? Because it transforms a verb into a noun. And then that noun relates to another noun with which it had no prior meaning, to bring a swoon to a stew. It's one of those colorless green ideas. In other words, it's a knowledge, an S1-2, a swoon-2. That's how the S of the signifier, without any bar, swoons to the other. And there's much more meaning in it than we're perhaps prepared to admit. To see the meaning is to recognize the madness. The signifier can be saturated in jua sauce. It's why I once raised the word saturated to um, the title of a little essay for the European Journal of Psychoanalysis on the seven saturated signifiers. Today we heard about nine uh, nine. Uh, points from Mark. I was at this time talking about seven saturated uh, signifiers. Pr traditionally, these three S's, the seven saturated signifiers, SSS, that was reserved within uh, our psychoanalytic knowledge for the sujet supposed savoir, the subject supposed to know. But it's the one who knows all alone. not the other supposed to know. It makes knowledge into a presupposition rather than a supposition. It's as if we can't anymore digest the other. The other comes pre-digested 
I like this word pre-digested because it was a word that my analyst highlighted during my first analysis in Toronto 15 years ago. She repeated back to me, pre-digested. The speaking being speaks with its jouissance. I wonder then about the master signifier. Where is it? Is that what we go in search of during an analysis? Lacan claimed that it's maybe possible to invent one. He said that all of our signifiers are only ever received, which means that we're full of them. All of them. He didn't say at this time that we're trapped in a network or a web of signifiers, barred. That's one of those Lacanian aphorisms that we take as a presupposition. When we presume the S barred, we risk missing the spar against the other. And in particular against the father. We're full of signifiers. Olive stew, it's olive stew. In other words, it's a recipe for anorexia. You're laughing, but I know a lot about anorexia. It was the symptom that brought me into analysis. I know it because the word pre-digested was a really important one for me 15 years ago. I'm only teaching from my own experience. And that's why I can say that the anorexic is the one who is full on infinity. And that's what the therapists, the scientists, the professors, the capitalists, those triumphant philosophers of our time keep cooking up for us cold, infinity. The anorexic is simply the one for whom nothing is chosen in place of the fullness of infinity. Instead of the seven saturated signifiers, nothing is eight. The symptom in the body. Uh, they're merged in the imaginary. Um, it's an imaginary inflation of the body, the ego, without recourse to the master signifier. The body inflates, the body in the mirror, it inflates, and the symbolic shrinks away to nothing. By the way, you, maybe you know that when anorexia became a really big topic in, a, in the United States, it was after all the fathers went away to war. You can only imagine what horrible stuff was happening out there um, on the front lines, the bombing, the killing, the tyranny. It was real. What's fascinating is that the word anorexia introduces a negation at the beginning of it. Anorexia, it's a negation. But it's a false negation. It's a faux neg. A negation which is nothing. Anorexia is actual is is defined uh, by not by the rejection of food for Lacan, but by the absence of any rejection of inflationary jouissance. So it's a matter of bringing the real back to the body, which is why Lacan asked if one could invent a signifier without meaning, one that's not received from the other. I lost my thread, so I need to try and find what I was going to say next. Um, the word saturated means to, to remain full. It emerged, I think, in the 16th century. It was an invention of science, chemistry. It was a scientific invention. Now, obviously, science has for a very long time been full of itself. What can stop science? It's equally obvious to me that saturation is a principle of exclusion. One that promotes isolation from the world, since there's already too much on one's plate. There's even some who insist upon growing their own food on their own farms, where food is always in abundance for them. And they live there on their farms the communes, to eat what one grows for oneself rather than what is offered to them from the market, does it imply that they're living on a farm without a lord? 
uh, it's with the Lord that one can begin to experiment with the contours of infinity. And that's exactly what the edge lord now does on social media. Incidentally, the edge lord is the one who exper who experiments with the contours of infinity, like the trifler in a video game. What are the boundaries to infinity? Maybe uh, psychoanalysis can offer a first point of contact with the world. Those timeless feuds on social media, so characteristic of the feudal mode, signal contemporary discontents. It's in the nature of feudalism to repeat itself and not to become incorporated into the dialectics of capitalism. That's my wager. The transition from feudalism to capitalism marked the invention of a threshold, an interface with the other. The history of political economy shows, I think, that it's only through capitalism and science that analytic discourse could have taken hold. Capitalism is a vanishing mediator only to the extent that it introduces the very mediator, the very mediation without saturation that would allow serfs to cook up something of their preliminary relationship to the world. So those who live on the farms and in the village, uh, we know this in sociology because it was a lesson from George Simmel, an early German sociologist, those who live on the farms and the villages on the periphery, they scoff, they often have often scoffed at the cold intelligence of the city dweller. That's why I insist upon bringing intelligence to the point of its stupidity. It's a continuation of my anarchism uh, in a Maoist key. When I say intelligence is an object, I mean that it's a gadget. And I think we're on the cusp of possibly realizing that artificial intelligence is the route through which science approaches fiction. Lacan said, woman is a symptom. It's a controversial statement. He said, woman is a symptom. But today we can see that your girlfriend is a fiction. And you can buy her for $99. With the gadget, intelligence will take hold of the sex bot. And she will eradicate the real in its entirety. Another question I just thought of, can the scientist accept the lie that's necessary as for, for their point of contact with the world? Or are they too smart for their own good? The sex bot comes pre-digested. You already know in advance, once you pay the $99 or whatever, that she's prepared to sleep with you. It's the crowning achievement of consent culture. There's no limits to the enjoyments that are now on offer. Lacan said, there is but, I'm quoting him, there is but one social symptom. Every individual is in effect a proletarian. That is to say that no discourse is at the disposal of the individual by means of which a social bond could be established, end quote. So can we say that the proletarian is fed up with feudal capitalism and with the responsibilities continually put onto his plate. It means that the proletariat is invented out of necessity. Without the factory, there are only the bedrooms and the universe is now populated by these non-dupes who wander lost without maps, even without uh, their guiding star desire. They're fed up with infinity and with the feuds, and they're cooking up new schemes to reach out to us. Uh, what has been called the party in Marxism, I'll shut up in a moment. What has been called the party in Marxism, I don't think can any more make a pretense at expressing the so-called common interests of the proletariat as it was put in the manifesto. Because quite simply, the category 
known as worker in its traditional form, has been replaced by those who enjoy. There's nothing any more common among each proletariat. They emerge one by one. And it leads them into analysis. Are we prepared to receive and recognize them as they reach out to us from their bedroom or social media walls? I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, you give us a, a lot. I'll definitely be listening to that again. I just wanted to say when I was laugh, I was laughing at all of Stu. You know, I was that was I thought that was an amusing thing. I just I was just laughed at the image. I would never laugh at um at your suffering. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't. In, I didn't intend that. All it's, of all of S two. Yeah, I just I was just laughing at, at all of Stu. It's just an, uh, something that go. Either way, um, I'd I'd say thank you, but um. Yeah, the, the the things that definitely get the whole idea, you know, um, of of Marshall McLuhan, uh, the medium is the message. Uh, that we are there is this sort of reality now where we're trying to encode ourselves in the medium itself, hard code ourselves in the medium, collapsing the reality of who we are into uh, the various avatars or presentation there's a closing a contraction and uh what you was really striking what you were talking about in regards to the um the sex bot uh or you know the ai girlfriend you know that you see the replica the gadget you see it everywhere but by 10 quid you can go on and there was an, an article that came out um where you know, the people really in, in credit, and there's lots of things going around. You can see it all over the internet, in seldom, and, and uh, the red pill movement, and the edge lords who live on who live on their farms. They live on their farms, and then they go on social media and say, "Look at this cabbage that I grew. This is why right being right wing is amazing because I can grow a fucking cabbage." Right? This is this is the reality that that, that we've got now, and and you know, th th there's nothing stranger to me. Then you get uh, with the trad movement where they they very loudly go online and shout about how traditional that the traditional they are online, uh, whilst you know on on their farms that they've run away from the city, talking about how amazing the cabbage that they've grown is, and uh, I, I just I, there's a massive contradiction there for me, but uh, go, going back to the, the saturation point and the AI girlfriend. And the whole replicas. There's, there is a point, and, and what I noticed in your thing is, is the, the contradiction or the paradox of, and I think you're using anorexia as a, as a point here of how we are saturated but consuming nothing. This idea that we are ultimately flooded with something that is ultimately toxic, but in the end, what is it? It's, it's not. It's something that can't sustain. It's something that doesn't sustain us in the slightest. And you know the, the the you find these incredibly lonely men, or you know, and whatnot, talking about how how wonderful it is they've got this this AI girlfriend, this replica, or whatever that they call the various uh, uh, um, Lathusian love of um, gadgets that they can get now. And you know, uh, they give them love. They give them love, or what they think, or is close enough to love. They want to be duped, right? But ultimately, it's it's nothing. It's it's ultimately nothing. Um, I'm rattling and I'm, I'm rambling, uh, but I'm going to hand it on over to to the floor for anyone else who wants to chip in. But thank you very much for your for your thoughts. It was, I really enjoyed that. It was great. Guys, you don't need to, uh, folks. You don't need to raise your hands. You, you just just jump in. Yeah. Yeah, please. Great talks. Really appreciate them. Uh, first, I like. I've been following both of your work for a long time and, you know, I really appreciate this, this direction you're going in thinking about toxic positivity and this sense of the one all alone. This, I, this really resonates with me. Um, I think it really is getting at what we see with social media and um, the, the basic libidinal dynamics were, we're facing right now. 
Um, so yeah, I just, I, I've never really had a chance to tell you how much I appreciate this, uh, this, this, I don't know what, how would we, a paradigm of jouissance in a way that you, you two are working out. Um, yeah, I really, I really think it's getting at something. And I know like some, like you and Slavoj have disagreed a little bit on it, but, um, I can't help but see a, 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 a anchoring truth of what you're getting at here where, um, this, this sense of like symbolic orders malfunctioned, um, uh, it's harder and harder to produce meaningful bonds. And so we're left to cultivate our own little idiosyncratic jouissance. This is only, it's like the symptom, right? It's the only thing that we've got that anchors us in, uh, this chaos. And so, and it's, it's part of the problem too. It's not like a, a, a fix. It's like you always talk about doing it from bad to worse. Right. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I get a lot out of this and, uh, a lot of my work right now, like I'm writing something, um, that's really influenced by this. And so I just want to say, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm interested to see where you both end up taking it. Um, one thing I want to say, Dwayne, so when you were talking about intelligence as a symptom that really registered with me and i'm just curious what you think about this it's almost as if we can take it back where like this gets at some fundamental thing in psychoanalysis which is we all know going back to freud when we think about human beings we think of us in terms of drives as opposed to instincts it's almost like intelligence could be the symptom of our loss of instinct that loss of instinctual animality and having to become drive beings. And that intelligence is that symptomatic fallout of the loss of instinct. Just curious what you think of that. Yeah, I quite like that. Um, that's a great way to put it. I should mention that um, uh, the, the apparent debates between Slavoj and I are in part motivated by Slavoj himself. Yeah. He's, he's encouraged me to to critique him and platformed my critiques of him and uh, even um, encouraged me to write a book um, that was meant to be a, a full-on kind of attack on, on Slavoj's uh, work, um, which ended up, it's being titled now Psychoanalytic Sociology, and it's gone in a slightly different direction. But um but I don't, I, I should say, I don't see it as a critique of his work, although maybe I has, have said that in the past, just kind of casually and haphazardly, I see it as a continuation of his work um, and, a, and a sort of resituating of his work to account for, as you put it, paradigms of Jouissant's. As for intelligence, um, you know, how does it work for the obsessional? we often talk about intellectualization. Obsessionals are constantly interpreting. In my first book in 2007, when I was writing it, Lacanian Realism, I don't know when it came out sometime after that, I, I talked about the good work of the slave. And you know, when we often think of the slave as a proletariat, we think of the work that's done in the factories and so on. But the, the psyche is a factory too, and intellectualization and intelligence is a type of factory. But that presumes lack. And that presumes a subject who's up against something, there's a nom de pair, and so on. But what I was kind of playing with is the idea of a form of intelligence that is a continuation or a substitute satisfaction um, in this sense, and that, in, that allows the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the enjoyment to continue and to perpetuate without the father's no, or anything like that. Um, and so I kind of begin there. Um, there's a way in which by witnessing it in artificial intelligence, it puts it somewhere, it places it somewhere. And by placing it somewhere, in some sense, we can see it for the fiction that it is, because it's a, it's a fabrication of science. You know, I'm really moved by this moment, I'm, I'm going on a tangent, but this moment when Lacan was in America and he's standing at the window in Baltimore and he's looking at the world around him. He's looking what's out there behind the screen that we could call the window that he was looking through. What's out there? He saw 
billboards. He saw, he saw everything. He said, everything but the trees, I think is how he put it, is the unconscious, which means it's all intelligence. It's a fiction. But he was able to witness it from without, from a distance. And that makes it a little bit different. Um, so I suppose that's all I could say there. Um, I was wondering if I could speak. Um, so when Mark said that, um, basically, it's like we're saturated with so much meaning and like toxic positivity, we don't know how to navigate it. That reminded me a bit about uh, George Bataille's ontology. I know I don't really agree with his style of religious mysticism, but he has this interesting um, ontology where we have economic models built on scarcity, but for him, it's like we're saturated with so much meaning that nihilism is not like a void or scarcity of meaning, but rather we just don't know how to navigate all this meaning that we have. So um, he has certain essays where he talks about that. So um, I, I sort of made that connection in my mind. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, yeah, George Bataille, you know, he, he talks about the um, the, ex the the economy the economy of excess, and you know that he talks about that in relation. Uh, was it to the sun, the, the solar anus, right? He talks about it in in relation to that. But uh, yeah, I I think you know even Lacan, uh, his concept of the real, uh, much later on, is like massively influenced by by by, by Bataille, along with the concept of non knowledge. Um, but that, I think the whole idea of of the the plenum that we're in, and you know this is it's it's false. It's not a real. It's not a real thing. It, it's 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 uh, it it's a perversion. I think I th and this is my own interpretation. Is it apes the theological? I am I am a theologian. I am uh, I am a you know, I believe I know I know there's different circumstances here, but I believe, you know, in a theological worldview. But the, the point is, is that what we have with the digital and the, the and I think the transition happened, you know, and I, I think it's all it's been there for a good while, you know, the, 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 from about the early 2000s. But the re I think things really started to crack up around 2016, maybe. And then after covid we've seen a real transition in this digital economy and how it's beginning to shape our lives in a in in a completely uh different orientation it's beginning to uh, the as, as Dwayne pointed out the limits are not there anymore the boundary between the screen and ourselves uh how we present i remember ages ago you know, i was uh, i was talking to people you know um i was saying oh you know people seem so angry online you know, they seem to be saturated in this anger. And, you know, but then you, you always have the, the people where people go, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's just online. Right. It's just online. People are nice outside. People are nice outside. And, you know, the, the world of negativity, the, the real world, you know, people are OK. But after I think COVID and um, the isolation that in that the that created uh, along with various form, uh, technological inventions uh, or, or I wouldn't say invention, but uh, uh, um, an inclination to use uh, the smartphone in a much more overt way where people are, const are on it all the time. And I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that I'm trying, I'm sounding like yeah, a Luddite, which, which I'm not, you know, it, it, I think, I think that what's that people wouldn't even think of saying that anymore. You know, if someone's being pissy online or being nasty online, people would really say that there is no recourse to the real world anymore. It's just, well, that's it. You know, uh, there's someone's being horrific online and they're engaged in, you know, a toxic jouissance. They're saturated and they're, they're projecting it towards some absolute enemy they've constructed in their heads. That isn't, you know, some false place. That's part and parcel of the world that we're in. And that's, as Dwayne pointed out, Thanks. Well, we say thanks to the, the fictions made by science that have been brought here, you know, in the here and now. And yeah, I think that um, the way we talk about saturation in regards to this, it, it's it's a false plenum insofar that, you know, and I think you you said this in another talk, uh, Dwayne, is that we can do whatever we want. 
you know it's there's there's a freedom that comes with with this world this world if we can go anywhere we can find information at the top of a button we can go and put our virtual re head, reality headsets on and you know um, get get stuck in the metaverse and you know we can have also there, there, there seems to be an endless proliferation of choice whilst at the same time there is this sort of strange determination that sh that's shaped by the saturation of the algorithm you know does that make sense i think uh but you know i've i've veered off slightly regarding your point about batai but i i can i can yeah the, the connection's definitely there uh does anyone else want to chip in thank you <laughs> yeah yeah uh first of all great talk it's really good to see both of you just exchange uh different ideas it's almost like uh, sort of hip hop cipher where everybody just like plugs in their own play on words, especially the puns. I love the puns and, and play on words, Dwayne. But thinking about saturation and this like excess of 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 jouissance and and infinite of meaning, it makes me think of uh, seminar three. So um, my colleague Nick and I are working on seminar three for our recordings now. And there's something interesting that he says, uh, Lacan says in the the beginning of neologisms of a patient, a psychotic patient of his that he refers to using this term gallop and nair. And then uh, with Schraber, uh, it's uh, nerve contacts. And so with the saturation of communication and jouissance and how we isolate ourselves from many things, the deterioration of the uh, social bonds and, and the decline of the paternal metaphor, it's like, would you say that these alternative movements of isolation, whether it's like uh, homesteading, growing your own food, uh, being an edge lord, and all that are like these sort of ways we're creating uh, our own sort of gallop and our own neologism without actually forging a, a community or social bond, because that would entitle both loss and lack and and being symbolically castrated. But you know, being in a in a law in, in a in a sort of uh, being duped. I, I think I, I, um, I'll points out which I find interesting, which I think is on the same level as of the neologist. Neologisms where you take uh, words and fuse them together to try and make something new, right? So it's, uh, I, I was talking to Dwayne the other day about, uh, I was trying to think about the connection between attention and saturation and came up with the neologism attenuation, right? And he said, no, that's not, I don't think it's particularly, because it's not leading anywhere. But what what's interesting is when you see, uh, you know, various people, online is that they will take various pre-digested what they think personas you know you'll get uh, you know a, a cartoon idea about what anarchism is and it's always uh reduced down to a flag okay and then they'll they'll fuse that with with some other pre-digested thing and put it together so you'll have ne uh, I, anarchist feudalist you know blah 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 and it's just a string of flags it's represented as a bunch of flags and then you'll have a short bio and you know and if you're on other platforms larger platforms i'm sure that they've they've come up with something uh, coherent to justify the neologism but yeah i think that there is something ultimately um in that myself i i think i think but i'll let i'll let uh Dwayne, do you want to pick up on that is it okay yeah uh, the neologism or what you called pun or um the equivocation in the form of a homophony. Um, Lacan used that a lot. He did it with the nom de pair. He did it with the non du pair. He did it with the uh, on and on and on and on. I did it today with as tu and so on. What's its function for Lacan in his later teaching? Its function is to separate the meaning, which you think to be common, which is the S1-2 to separate it from the jouissance that's at stake in it. The equivocation separates the meaning from the jouissance. When you say non dupe air, you can't deploy the Lacanian aphorism of the non du pair. You're forced to, to move away from the common understanding that maybe characterizes what we think we know about Lacan and his teaching from the enjoyment that's at stake in it. And when you separate that, in some sense, you get some distance from the delusion. 
distance from what is a delusion for the late Lacan it was very clear it's the coupling of s1 with s2 s1 and s2 taken together that's a delusion in other words it's meaning it's knowledge this is delusion discourse it's delusion um which doesn't mean that the psychoanalyst is without delusion of course but the equivocation is a cut. It's a way of cutting the meaning from the enjoyment. And you can confront it in that way. And you can release the fixations that were at play, perhaps, in the pairing of the S1 and the S2. The neologism could be something like an invention. I wanted to talk a little bit about, we talked so much about the saturation and the incestuous nature of social media or maybe I do, I don't know. Um, it, it seems to me without limits and all this other stuff. And it, it seems, oh, that's bad. But wait a minute, because if you think about how social media is being used, it's also a conduit through which people are reaching out to the world, precisely through their enjoyment. So we have a lot of makeshift philosophers, a lot of people who are reaching out to analysts, who are reaching out to Lacan, who are reaching out to, uh, to the work of Zizek and so on through social media. And it's almost exclusively in, in some cases on social media, which means that it's not simply about barring the jouissance. It means, can we discover something within the jouissance, an invention, whatever it is, that can, that can um, cut through it a bit of one's own uh, choosing. So, um, I, you know, I, I get a little, I get a little uh, worried because I think that uh, social media, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like, I don't know if you've read Lacan's seminar on anxiety. Lacan's seminar on anxiety is very interesting because he talks about this phrase port of access. That's one way to translate it. There's a way in which, you know, anxiety can move you toward uh, desire, but it can also be a signal you're going back to Jewish and this sort of stuff. In, in a homologous sort of way, I think that social media, um, it can be a site of invention as well. I, I, there's a lot of people, for example, who write me emails, long emails. They're trying to reach out to something. And they're using social media, they're using Twitter, they're using Facebook, and so on. You know, I remember myself when I was very young in my bedroom, I reached out to the world through my computer, my first girlfriend. I met her on ICQ, which is a wonderful homophony. I seek you. Um, and so there's a way in which it's not simply like, oh, this is bad. But this is also, we have to discover what within it is reaching out. No, no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I, you know, but I think that what to call it is ultimately a, you know, a double-edged sword. And we, we're, we're not, we're not talking here about, uh, you know, why social media is bad, uh, or in, uh, it's not even a discussion about uh, social media per se. It's uh, a discussion of of what we think are material conditions leading to this point of saturation which will always come as a double-edged sword and i think that yes there is absolutely you know um a real the, the for, for many people you know who are isolated uh, and you know have various symptoms and aspects you know life without social media would be hell you know and i i know myself i i went through a, a real stage of isolation you know, as as a as a good neurotic, you know, is that you, you sort of withdraw yourself completely from 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 the world, and you know, you uh, close yourself off and barely communicate. Social media is is a lifeline, and uh, it's it's a way of being able to. And it's only you know, I, I started speaking to you, Dwayne, during that, that that time, and then it was from there, you know, we started doing other work. So it's 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 never without. Um, these uh these effects but it's it's um yeah no i i think i, I completely agree um there was something else that, that, that came up in in D no does anyone else want to chip in can i speak oh go ahead yes Do you hear me we hear you 
Okay, uh, hi, and thanks hi. for having me. This conversation is really interesting. I don't know, I have, um, I have a question that I'm, I'm not sure if it's related, but uh, um, there is like um, this uh, test in computation studies that it's called the Turing test, which is uh, working in this way. There are two different people uh, sitting in two different rooms. One is a man and one is a woman. And then there is a tester, <clears throat> a tester, uh, a third person that through conversation with these two people that he can't see because they are in different rooms, he needs to understand which one is a woman and which one is a man. So there is this uh, kind of uh, gender uh, in instability in, uh, that is uh, crucial for understanding if a machine can behave and think as a, as a man. And uh, <clears throat> this is Turing, and he wrote this uh, test uh, because he never, he never uh, actually did it because there were not the technology. It was just like the designing of a test uh, as, an, as a mind experiment to, to see if a machine can imitate human behavior in a way that is undistinguishable from, from a human being. Um, my question is related to uh, the um, sexual uh, laws, the, um, the formulas of sexuation uh, of Lacan, because in, in, the, in the, the way he wrote these uh, laws of sexuation, it's really using a mathematical um, terminology. He used a math theme and symbols, and it's like very logical. Uh, my question is, do you think that these laws of sexuation uh, have mathematical validity or is just a way how he uh, preferred to uh, write down concepts? So it, it, do they have a mathematical validity? Because if they do, if they have mathematical validity, these uh, laws of succession could be the key to build the Turing uh, machine, because if these formulations, these um, laws of sexuation have a, a mathematical validity, then they can be used to encode a machine that could do very well into the um, Turing test. But I'm not sure if they have mathematical validity. And I had some, I, I, I looked around and searched, but I was not very lucky. So maybe you can cast some light on this doubt I have. Sorry if it was a bit too long. Thank you. No, no, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I'll uh, chip in uh, and then Dwayne uh, can go ahead. But the, the, the laws of sexuation, um, as far as, you know, as I know, it, it's about talking about the inherent antagonism within language itself. We always say more than we mean and more than we say. And as such, we are, as we're, we enter uh, the, the, the symbolic order, we are sexuated at various positions. And that means that there is always a, a misrelation, not only to the other sex who speaks from another position, but also to ourselves. There's always something of an excess in our language that, that results in us missing uh, Eat ourselves and each other, and ultimately, uh, what he was he was he was getting at, I think, and especially in seminar twenty, it's a he's having a pop at the whole yin yang thing. Uh, the idea that there is like this sort of nice fixed relation or or, or fixity between people and ourselves, or and and also the the um, the whole Aris, uh, platonic world view that came with that, as you know. Uh, uh, the, the world as form, you know, uh, the, the 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 masculine forms and the 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 feminine matter coming together, coming together. But what I think thinks interesting about the whole idea of the Turing test in relation uh, to to sexual to sexuality is that it, it's happening to us, you know, right now. The idea of wanting to be duped by 
by by by these AI girlfriends. It's you know people want to be able to be a you know not tell the difference at so at, at a certain at a certain level. People want to be fooled, and it's not about the it, what's interesting about it is that it's not so much or it, it's about um, the 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 image, so to speak, like having a perfectly you know CGI girlfriend or whatever. It's about the text messages, right? People want the fantasy of having, you know, uh, a partner texting you, are you okay after work or whatever? That's where the relation or the non-relation comes. People want to be duped in, at that level. Um, but, you know, in terms of, it, you know, in regards to the, the, that, that, that type of Turing test, whether the, 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 this mathematical equation can be used in such, I, I, I wouldn't know, but all I know is that we are, in essence, a type of Turing test happening right now in all of us, uh, in, 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 insofar that these gadgets are being sold to us, we, we, you know, that we can engage in these sex bots or whatever. I'll let Dwayne take over. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a, I, I, I'm not sure what to say. I, I, what, a, what an incredible question. I really liked it. And I like the way you described it. Is, is it a man or is it a woman? Um, yeah. It takes uh, a lot of intelligence to try and... Uh, figure out an answer to that question and, and we find it doesn't ever help um, the question of what is a woman um, I think that um, mathematics this is a very big question in Lacan I can't speak to the sexuation stuff quite so much but I think that uh, Lacan discovered against a conceptual approach what he called the math theme I don't think Lacan was against mathematics, but I think that there's something in the math theme for Lacan in this formal, uh, this uh, integrally transmitted is how we put it, um, math theme. Integrally transmitted means there's nothing lost in it. Um, that allowed a reduction of Jouissant's. It's a letter. And I think that that's what Lacan saw in his math theme, was a, a, a way to form a pact of the symbolic with the real of Jouissant's. Uh, and in some sense, I think this is, um, this is something that Miller picked up in a text that I mentioned when I was speaking earlier today in Suture, where he was describing the relationship of one to zero and the suturing effect that had to take place for counting to get off the ground. Counting is a form of repetition. Um, so uh, the Turing machine, it's, it's a test of intelligence, is it not? Uh, but it's a test of intelligence that in my understanding of what you've said, is a test of whether or not the woman exists. Uh, that makes it quite different than the intelligence-based girlfriend who precisely makes the woman exist as intelligence. It's quite a different position. It's almost as if um, we're so intent on making the woman exist today that we can't that we've 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 sutured the very space of woman. Where is she? Um, so I I don't really have a satisfactory answer. I'm just uh, I'm moved by your question, and I think it's a really good one. Uh, so I'll I'll uh, I'll keep it in mind. Thank yeah, you. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. They are very enlightening. Yeah. Incidentally, I'll go, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, right. please. Oh, no, I, I just wanted to follow up on something Mark said earlier on. So if you want me to hold off. No, no, please. Okay. So Mark, the, you, you clarified something. And, and I think this is maybe one of the, the main either confusions or misunderstandings of your, your, your position, of both of your positions here, um, concerning this paradigm of reasons we're in, which is when we talk about generalized foreclosure or general psychosis like you're talking about it 
a lot of people go, so what, you're saying we're clinically psychotics? And I think this is incredibly important to make this clarification. I mean, and, and so I've kind of, like I said, I've been living with these insights I've gotten from you two and just a little anecdote, right, from my own experience. But I totally see how it, it, not only is it like there's this flood of constant renaissance that we're living with, um, it also it seems like an imperative, super egoic, right? There's this dimension of it where it's like almost our duty to to live according to the symptom or something. But it's funny. So here's where I see negative negativity pop up um, in like a fundamental way for me. So I'm a delivery driver, and once I started this job, a lot of the places I used to go to all the time as a kid, I started delivering to. The weird thing is I had to deliver to the dock or go in the back door. All of these areas of these stores that I would have never thought to walk into, right? Cross the, the almost the, it's a no, right? It's, there's zones. I mean, look, I have a lot of issues with D and G, but this idea of striated space, like there's, there's certain spots in stores I'm allowed to walk around others that, that are just completely prohibited. But as a delivery driver, once I have this, like, a, you know, permission from the big other, I don't even think about it. I just walk in the back, I walk in the, the restricted area, deliver their product and leave. But then when I go back in the store as a customer, the no is completely back. I wouldn't think, even consider about walking, you know, behind the curtain, walking behind, uh, you know, uh, the, the doors for, um, employees only and so it's this weird thing where I'm constantly comprehending prohibition like it, it, it's not psychotic in that sense of course I get prohibition I, I think my the point I'm trying to make here is like yes we register prohibition all the time you can't just walk up at somebody at the coffee shop I'm at a coffee shop right now if I walked up to somebody at a table and going hey that's my favorite table get up get out of here of course I'm not going to do that but the point is even though these types of prohibitions are operative. It doesn't change the fact that we're still flooded mm -hmm. by this, this, this jouissance, this, this toxic positivity. And so it's like the prohibitions, even though they're in place in a lot of ways, it still can't, they still can't fend off this flood that we're all saturated in. Is that? No, no, it makes, it makes absolute perfect sense. Really interesting. You know, it's, uh, you know, in terms of how, uh, uh, in the position of the, of the work, uh, that you do you have, you, you you're of, of nav navigating the big other and various prohibitions that um you know if if you're not in that position that you're you are in uh exactly. they'd be, be completely imperceptible and you know that that lies into you know, i think uh, comes into your, your interest in 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 liminal space yes as well. yeah. you know this idea the idea of these uh spaces uh which lie beyond the periphery um but you have access to and uh, there was something, you know, I, I, I was completely fascinated with what you said. Now, now that's really um, open, open that up for me. But no, I, I don't. I, I, it's not. Um, and I think about a lot of the problem that we have now is a, a type of what I call the marvelization, or you know, a type of manichaeism. Whatever. It's either this or, or that. You know, it's, it's that and everything else. But I don't. You know, yes, there is definitely a type of degeneration of the paternal metaphor. There is problems in communication that's resulted in the, the, the pre-digested, you know, the idea that we think uh, communication is just, uh, in, and you see it a lot in communication online where people don't actually communicate with each other. It's just type of snippets that they take and, and put together, uh, touch grass, do that. You know, you know what I'm saying? That the, these sort of um, s small like statements or pre-digested points that people use to give the sense of communication, but they're not, actually engaging in a discussion or communicating in any way it's a way of being able to, to to navigate that but that's not to say that that thing that's happening isn't happening alongside this, this whole reality of working working class people and working people who are constantly in a world navigating a difficult field of prohibition that's that's just reality it's it's part and parcel of what's happened does that make sense yeah totally and, and it makes me think like i don't know it's like a remnant of the old symbolic order where because here's the thing 
customers, there's no problem with grocery stores with people walking behind the counter. This isn't an issue they face. Everybody knows you can't go walking uh, in the employees only space. And yet the differences online, and I think we've all experienced it, there's no big other mapping there or, or etiquette protocols online. And I think that's part of the issue is that what is prohibited online is far blurrier than it is in something as simple as no, this is off limits, this is restricted space, you can't go back there. Right, and, and that, so that results- It's a different type of space, right? No, no, I, can, I think that that results in the the absolute othering of the other, where we, we don't have the ability to be able to uh, um, navigate the difference between an adversary, an opponent, which I think, you know, the, the, the difference between an adversary and an opponent is that they're always afforded the dignity within the symbolic. You know, you can you can engage with them. And I know we don't we talk about, we don't talk or, or debate Nazis or whatever, but it's there is this a difference but with in this world the saturated world if you will there is no means of being able uh to 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 engage that so there's this complete othering monstering uh and ultimately foreclosure pushing out completely it's it's uh and you you see it all the time and um you know i think that it's it's definitely got something to do with what you're saying, I think there is this when we're, you know, day to day life, there is a, a type of when we're, we're actually encountering people um, and, and speaking to people, we navigate uh, the subtleties of that stuff. And that's got to do with phenomenology and space and all that other stuff. Um, whilst online, it's just not there. So we end up legislate, trying to legislate it into existence. Right. And it just doesn't work, I think. No, I, 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 I'm rambling a little bit, but you've keep given in me mind, some... keep in mind that the absence of the name of the father does not mean there are no prohibitions. It means precisely there are more prohibitions. That's a very good point. No, 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 no. no. That, yeah, well, well that must yeah. because it, it means when the no of the father receives from the symbolic, you witness the prohibitions in your environment in a real register. Look at the way space has changed since the 1990s. Let's say commercial space. But I remember when I would go to a home and I knew which door to go into. I knew because in some sense, a house was a Taurus. You can go in the front door and right out the back. It had a true hole, what in topology is referred to as a true hole. Now we don't know which door to go into. And what Frederick Jameson referred to as the Benvenuto, you know, the, the hotel in his essay on postmodernism from California, I think it, it came at a very interesting moment in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s. He was writing about postmodernism as the cultural logic of late capitalism and this sort of stuff. We're witnessing more and more that when you go to shops, you can walk behind the register. I don't know. I mean, you go to Toronto and you can't tell where the where, what space you're supposed to be in anymore. And this is happening more and more. Not only that, but you don't know how to get into the shop. This was what Frederick Jameson referred to when he was discussing this postmodern piece of architecture in California. He said, try and find your way in. And once you're in, you don't know how to get out because the, the exit is on a different floor and so on. In other words, it's in continuity with infinity. You cannot find your way in or out. In some sense, you're always in, even when you're out. It's fascinating. You could be on the floor that's the, the floor for the hotel part um, when you enter, but you really got to go down a floor to get to the commercial space and so on. You know, it's, it's just fascinating because what it means is that you need to find where your space is there. I don't know. I went to Holt Renfew in Toronto not so long ago, and I couldn't find my space because the $5, uh, let's say $5, the $10 t-shirt was beside the $500 uh, jacket. I don't know where my space is there. In some sense, I think architecture has increasingly moved in this direction, you know, and more and more we're trying to find a through hole and we're not finding it. I also worked, I talked about this a few years ago in Russia. When I was working in Russia, there was a space that was literally modeled off of the 
Canadian film series Cube. You know this? Yeah, that you have seen it. It's a great film. Yeah. And it's it's all windows, and you can't seem to ever get out. And even when I got out, when I was escaping the war, it was like I was still there. You had employees who were talking about waking up in the middle of the night, worried that they were going to miss a phone call, because in some sense, they're always working. You know, this is what the, the collapse of the work-life balance really means. It mm -hmm. means there's no there's no space. You know, and, and you see this. You see this. What's it called? If you uh, with Elon Musk and you know, and it's not even Twitter now, is it? It's just uh, a math theme. It's a uh, X. You know, the people that work there, they, they have to. They take their beds and they stay. stay they, 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 and you know, it's reminiscent of of, of the life of the, of the game developer. You know, I don't know if people know so the video game industry. Um, there is no space. Literally, as you say, it's uh, people are in this multi-billion dollar industry, but the workers are ultimately working consistently all the time. Um, and, and what they're doing is they're making a work, they're making worlds, but they have no world. You know, it's uh, that they they're in their bedrooms constantly, or they bring their bedroom to the workspace. No, no, yeah, what you're 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 saying that there's, you know, it's it's uh, there was something else. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. The way you said something really interesting, and this is talking about. Uh, you said a while ago, and I'm trying to paraphrase. I'll paraphrase you here. Is that in the past? Is that you had people going into caves, into a sacred space, and then they come out, right, and then they go out into the world. You know, the the Zarathustra figure right now it's the other way around people you said i quote go in go from this from the world into caves is that so, sorry oh, I, I, it's one young she's she's just transferred space yeah um so yeah did could you uh reflect on that for us so i think it's a really interesting point in regards to what we're talking about here Sorry, what was the question? The, it was like, um, you, the, uh, can you can you tell us more about how we're seeking caves? Uh, um, yeah, it's. Um, I, I I mean, I've mentioned it so many times. I I don't want to repeat so much. So let's see if I cannot repeat. Um, repeat with uh, different. <laughs> the, the idea, you know, was really. When did, I was inspired by this idea about uh, eight years ago when I reverted to Islam for love. And um, I read uh, a narrative, uh, The Seven Sleepers in the Cave. And in this story, we're told that there's you're living in a pagan world of excess, of what Todd McGowan calls pure excess in his forthcoming book. Um, and in this world, you're free you're radically free to worship any god um, or not to worship a god, whatever you like. And, and the pain of that suffering was so intense for these people that they desired to, uh, I wouldn't say desired, they, they sought out a cave to sleep and to dream and to worship one god. And I think in some sense, that's what a lot of people are facing today. Um, they're, they're looking for a cave that would limit the jouissance. Unfortunately, they're looking uh, for permission to have those boundaries from capitalism. And so they're turning to, this is a point that Slavoj Žižek has taken from me in various forums. I've given him a few examples, the light phone. You know, they're buying the light phone, which is a phone that, uh, that uh, says you can only make calls and you can only text people. You can't do anything else. In other words, we will shelter you from the enjoyment. Another example was um, these uh, Ivy League American professors who were giving a whole seminar series in California a few years ago um, about applications that you can install on your, um, on your computer that will um, block out all of social media and the internet so that you can write your article. Uh, another example was Black Mirror Nose Dive, which uh, Zizek also took this one and put it in a book somewhere uh, from me. 
uh, where there's a woman who's out in the world and she has to perform and be happy because her her everything's about feedback and that feedback is monetized and this sort of stuff. And so at the end, she ends up in prison, which is a cave, and there's like this beautiful moment. It's like liberation to be in a prison. Uh, because I think there is something about being in a prison, because when you're in a prison, prison, you desire freedom. And I think it's much better in some sense to desire the freedom than to actually have it. No, no, I think that that's a really interesting, and you find that there's a great... Uh... Have you, uh, Joris Cole's Husemans Against Nature. Um, it's a really, really interesting book precisely about dealing with uh, or working with Iceland, that the fantasy is always greater. The thing, there's a whole story where he has this wonderful um, vision of going to a Victorian pub because he reads um, Oliver Twist. And so he, he has this whole idea, he's like a rich aristocrat of buying all the different clothes, putting it all together, um bringing everything getting his the, the horse and cart getting his servants i'm going to go to london and drink you know stout and, he, and then he gets to the gets the he's in france he gets to the car goes down to the road goes in a pub a local local french pub sits there has one drink and just imagines himself in in london and then realize the fantasy is just as good as london and goes back home it's a it's a but it's 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 a really interesting book about how um, you know, the fantasy is greater than the reality. But uh, but I think there's e there is something even even more than that. That what we see today are people buying uh, their limitations. People buy. Uh, I got what would be a term for this? A commodified name of the father. It's it's uh, buy, buying points of authority. It's being sold back to them in this limitless world. You know, and I think that, the, you know, the re you find this with the, the trad movement, you know, a lot of trad cats or whatever you want to, what you, you call them. But it's it's pretty much, you know, they're buying limitations as a commodity and then gloating about the thing, the commodity that they've bought. Look how limited I am. Look at the world I've bought because a world is only a world with limits. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there's something definitely there. Does anyone else want to chip in here? Yes. Uh, not particularly to what you just said, but but something that Dwayne said earlier that uh, stuck out to me. He, uh, you mentioned going through this house, and it's no longer a Taurus, yeah, almost like a a rat in a maze, which made me think of uh, you know Neuralink and a wired brain, which perhaps confuses this notion of a a prison. So I, I'm I'm interested in how you uh, I, I guess conceptualize this. Yes, that, that's uh, that's really wonderful. I really like what Slavoj has to say about this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think um, at least with the maze, you can you can find the way in, and hopefully with luck, you'll find your way out. You know, today it's it's kind of um, nice to hear from you. By the way, um, it's um, today I was listening to the radio, CBC radio, in my car while I was driving to the cafe, and. Um, would you believe it? Uh, not far from here, there's a very large corn maze. People travel from afar to go to it. It's very large. I can't emphasize that enough. It's huge. Um, and I, apparently there was a crisis there in this maze because um, the, the farmer, it was the first day. You can find this if you Google it. It was the first day that he set up the maze for the season. And he forgot to put an exit and he closed the entrance and he went out and he did his his work all day. And in the morning he woke up and he saw all these cars still in his farm parking lot. They were there all night. They defecated there. You know, there was no spot for their defecation. There was no spot for their their objects to go. So it remained with them in space, in the space they were at. They carried their object in their pockets that night. Um, and it, it was chaos. And at the end of it, you know what he did? Uh, he just plowed through a straight line. Um, it was a nice invention to create an opening for them to get out. But yeah, I think um, instead of prisons, we have prisms today. There's another little cipher for you. Some prisms. Uh, prisms are quite different. There are many colors. 
um, and we have many colors uh, today instead of uh, instead of a prison. Uh, I'm not. I think that could be a false opposition, but uh, but I, I think it nonetheless um, describes the situation we're in. Um, shall we stop, folks? I would say thank you very much for everyone for, for the contributions, and thank you so much, Dwayne, as well for, uh, for that. And thank you, Mikey, uh, for, 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 for popping on. Andrew, thank you, thank you to everyone. Thank you a lot. So great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good to thank see you all. all. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so, all right. Well, take care. Godspeed. Uh, we'll, it's next week. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah.